Hello everyone and welcome to my Eclipse class guide for Gloomhaven. If you are worried about spoilers and you haven't unlocked this class and you want to keep yourself uh, safe from spoilers, then please click off now because we will be going in detail into this character. Some items as well might pop up that haven't maybe been unlocked in your game yet, so bear that in mind. I will, as always, try and chapter everything below for you so you can jump around a little bit and if you are worried about spoilers for items, then you can kind of just like skim over the item section of this video if you would like if you do enjoy the video please make sure you hit that like button and subscribe if you're not already there's loads of new subscribers to the channel recently so thank you all so much guys for subbing it, it really means so much to me and it helps me out a lot on uh, getting these videos out there for everyone so thank you all so much and yeah if you do enjoy the content then consider subscribing because i've got guides for every single character coming up and i've also got a lot of guides already done so check out my channel below I also stream regularly on Twitch at twitch.tv slash mandatoryquests where I stream every Monday, Wednesday and Sunday. Come hang out, play some Gloomhaven with me, just talk Gloomhaven. Uh, it's always a good time, so just come hang out, yeah. Okay, that's with all the formalities. Let's get on with the guide for the Night Shroud. Okay, so before we get stuck in to the Night Shroud, I think it's important that we talk a little bit about the characters before we kind of delve into the guide on how to play. This character is, in my opinion, the strongest character, or the potentially the strongest character in Gloom even as a standalone character. So as somebody who is very self-sufficient, you have your own game plan, you can execute that game plan without any help really from any other characters, and you can be incredibly strong. And this can lead to a few issues with this character in my opinion one being that the overpowered nature of his character does mean that once you've kind of tasted the power it can be sometimes hard to go back to another character that uh, doesn't quite uh, do as much as this character can do uh, the other problem is is that a lower player count so with only two players if you're playing just a duo with somebody else this character doesn't really contribute a lot to uh, the kind of teamwork element. Although you do a lot and you are, well, a hugely powerful character and you will do a lot. Generally, the way I like to describe the Night Shroud is you have a hell of a lot of fun playing the Night Shroud, but other people don't really have fun watching you play the Night Shroud. And the reason is, is that you actually abuse two mechanics that are incredibly strong in the game. The first being invisibility. So being able to go invisible so that enemies can't attack you. You can block pathways. You can open doors to stop enemies from taking turns. Uh, invisibility is a broken mechanic in my opinion it's um especially this character because it's a main theme and you can uh, reliably do it over and over and over again and that means that essentially you're just not even on the map to the enemies which means that often your ally is going to be attacked a lot and you're not so in terms of sharing damage round, it doesn't bode very well, hence why at two players it can sometimes be a bit frustrating to be the person not playing the Night Shroud. You often don't really have anything to kind of contribute in terms of team discussions. So on, you know, someone saying, let's try and move here and do this and coordinate as a team. Quite often you're like, I'm just going to go over here and I'm going to deal with this enemy and then I'm going to be invisible. So the other mechanic that this character has is the execute mechanic. So when we talk about execute, every character in Gloomhaven has a execute ability. This is basically just a kill an enemy ability, usually a burn and uh, usually at high levels. But the Night Shroud is the exception to the rule. And this character does have a kill card at level one. Uh, that kill card is Spirit of the Night. Incredibly strong ability, just being able to remove an enemy every single rest cycle is just insanely powerful and it helps to swing uh, the battle sort of in your favor really and start so meaning that you have an advantage and you can start ganging up on enemies rather than enemies ganging up on you yeah it's a it's an extremely powerful effect so the combination of these two abilities being able to kill something then go invisible so that the enemies can't really react to you in any way or punish you perhaps for having to overextend into doing this ability is just yeah incredibly strong so as a full caveat to this character i don't really recommend this character in a two-person party mainly the teamwork issues and mainly because a lot of the damage is going to fall on your teammate also because in two-player you often have more elites compared to normal enemies so the kind of the way that the uh, the balance of the enemies is slightly different especially in the campaign it's a bit different in guildmaster so guildmaster is kind of a bit flatter in that respect whereas the campaign is is definitely different so spirit of the night although still very strong is not going to be quite as good so there might be some variations of the build you might want to do at two players 
that this character is playable at two players to be clear but i think you would need to perhaps make a few adjustments to the build to be a bit more involved in the game and you'll see some opportunities to do that as we level up i just wanted to caveat that at the beginning of this video because a lot of people will be very excited to play this character because they're very very strong i think it thrives much better at three and with four especially if you're playing um, multiplayer. Now, if you are playing solo, then obviously doing a two-person party, it's not so bad. You can definitely kind of come up with some builds where everybody is supporting the Night Shroud. So you're just trying to basically put, you know, as much resources into the Night Shroud as possible. So if you don't mind having a bit of a sacrificial character in your party, if you're playing solo, then that's fine. It's just not nice to be on the other end of that if you are playing multiplayer, that's all. Okay, so just before we get onto the cards, I think it's important to talk about some of the other sort of small things that this character really cares about. So we have nine cards, okay, which is similar to the Scoundrel. Uh, this character is very similar to the Scoundrel. It's a rogue type character. So if you've played the Scoundrel before, then you'll be sort of similar to the way this character feels, although it is a different way of playing, but it has some similarities in, in what, what it can do. Um, but essentially, this this nine cards is quite a small hand size, which means that we're not going to be able to burn very many cards, which is important thing to think about. Uh, also, our movement is terrible on this character. Absolutely terrible. Um, so we don't have as much movement as the Scoundrel. I mean, the Scoundrel has like move sixes and move fours, move fives. No, we don't get any of that. And also, compared to the Scoundrel, our most important resource is our dark element, whereas the Scoundrel doesn't really have uh, an element as a resource, but just has ally positioning as their kind of resource that they use, right? Making sure that allies are in the right place and flanking but bonuses and things like that, or enemies are in the right place. So that's their kind of way of playing, where ours is just, let's make sure that we make our dark element and we consume it in the right ways when we can. So that does mean that we can't afford many burn cards, and it also means that movement is a premium for us. So we're going to have to keep thinking about ways that we can move throughout the level of ways going to get left behind and we're just going to really struggle keep that in mind what we really need to be thinking about is we need to be thinking about cards that we don't have to burn and we need to be thinking about cards that generate dark because that's like our main resource and that can move at the same time okay so uh we've got black knives is the first card during our next four attack actions while invisible we can perform an attack to range three as the final part of the action this is actually a no an okay effect this is absolutely fine but it has that big red flag of that burn on it which means that it would very much tax our hand we would end up going down to eight so it's not a card we want to readily burn but that's not always bad because you know we can burn a card towards the end of the scenario that's fine but the way that this is worded and um, there's not often times when you at least with this build, we're going to be invisible regularly. We're going to be invisible maybe once or twice, um, well, twice in uh, a particular rest cycle at level one. So you could maybe have in two rest cycles kind of use all of the charges of this potentially. But also the other thing is that this does kind of cost us a turn off from attacking or doing something else as well. So there is kind of like an opportunity cost in the sense that you are... Uh, instead of playing a top attack action, you are playing a burn to get yourself more attacks later on, right? So that is worth kind of thinking about a little bit as well. Uh, the bottom is an attack to model, which is absolutely fine. Um, the only reason why this card doesn't actually make our cut really is just because it doesn't have any kind of dark generation or decent movement on it. And that's really what we're looking for at level one. It's This isn't a bad card by any means, and certain invisibility builds might actually quite enjoy running this i think for a bit of fun but this is not something that for this particular build where we're going to be going you know movement and dark is what we really want to be and invisibility is going to be part of what we do but it's going to be very much uh, the supporting element of the build so this is just not really for us um, so cloak of shade is the next card we've got attack one make dark on top that's good we've got some dark generation it is only an attack one but you know, attack one will have to do uh, level one unfortunately we'll do what we need to do to make dark if we do and the bottom is move three make invisible so this is one way that we will be using invisibility so this gives us a way to move and go invisible by um, consuming a little bit of dark so this can work quite nicely in setting up another card that we have coming up in a little bit which we'll get into but this is uh yeah just a really nice uh bit of movement and some side value. sometimes you might actually only use this as just a move three uh, sometimes you might just use this as the attack one to make dark but i like this card because it gives you a variety of things that you can do with it and if you wanted to switch up your plan a little bit you've you've got some opportunity with this next up 
We've got Empowering Void. I love Empowering Void. I think this is an absolutely amazing card. I have a lot of fun playing Empowering Void. And this is, uh, the top is Attack 2. And we can consume Dark to double the value of all of our move abilities this turn. Not super, super exciting, but as we said, sometimes we're really slow. So being able to perhaps um, get to the ending tile of a scenario or uh, get really up and close and personal to a boss because we've really, you know, flagged behind for whatever reason or get ourselves to some kind of loot then i think that that can be fine uh the bottom though this is where it's really at is move to double the value of all your attack abilities this turn so this is like crazy good right we can basically double our attack this turn now it's important it isn't actually doubling our attack it is actually double the value of our attack abilities this turn so what this does is it just doubles the value that we have here so this would be an attack four essentially so it just means that whatever the value next to the little sword that's on your sort of card it doubles that value and that's important for something that we're coming up to next but i love empowering void i think it's great it's a good use of the dark element and we have a very nice little combo where we can do a big attack with it coming up too so keep that in mind uh we have doomed breeze which is attack one range three and a model uh, makes dark one xp again it's just a role player for us here this is quite an important one because uh it's a ranged attack which means that we don't have to it's, it's less likely that we won't be able to hit this right in certain situations you might actually not be able to generate the dark on cloak of shade with the top because you can't get into range to hit something well doom breeze was going to be sort of like your your go-to card in that instance so i like to doomed breeze because also uh, you can kind of move towards the enemy that you want to potentially uh, execute yourself using spirit of the night and then you can sort of model a different enemy um, that maybe some of your allies are dealing with or that you can't kill or for whatever reason so i like this because it's a bit of damage split as well uh, and the bottom is move three curse target one adjacent enemy it's just a move three with a bit of upside for it so uh, we really like it uh, in terms of initiative you'll notice just from looking that this character has very good early initiative to begin with and that gets even better as we go on so initiative is not really an issue for this character uh, we do have a few kind of go late cards as well so sometimes you can do the the tricky go late then go early or go early go late while invisible so there are some tricks you can play there with initiative with this character but generally speaking we've got some some really good early initiatives Enervating wound is the next card uh, which is attack for wound heal for self make dark 2 xp and it is a burn um, so this is a really nice attack and it's a heal in a pinch so if we get ourselves into a bit of trouble we get caught you know in a bad positioning and our invisibility um, we don't have that up this can just sort of yeah get you out of a bit of trouble if you like and the attack four is a decent sized attack and the wound is some extra points of damage maybe you know potentially uh, it is 77 initiative so you would kind of have to pair this with an early initiative if you wanted to maybe uh, try and get the enemy to take the tick of wound damage that turn but uh, that shouldn't be too hard you can kind of pair it with with some of these other cards that we've got for example like doom breeze so not too much of a problem um the bottom is just a move four we're using it as a move four <laughs> and it is sufficient for allowing us to move through the uh, levels between rooms and that's really what it's for this card is definitely a just help us move around for most of the scenario and then at towards the end it's going to be a big attack and get us two xp so it's nothing crazy special here but it's uh yeah it helps us get the job done next up we have spirit of the night so this is the kind of hallmark card and this is one of the best if not the best level one card that any character ever gets access to in gloomhaven spoiler maybe right there but it really is that good and to be honest it wouldn't take you much to kind of realize that just by looking at the card right so attack three which is just not what you're doing with this card ever uh, but or you can consume dark and you're killing one normal target instead which is definitely what you're doing so being able to kill an enemy and just take an enemy out off the board it's just completely flips the tables of most scenarios in your favor and yeah you just this card is just nuts absolutely bonkers good the bottom is move six create dark uh, one xp and a burn you're not using this until right to the end anyway so you know, being able to burn this card for just one free xp towards the end of the scenario maybe to move on to a hex to get some treasure perfect this is all, all you've ever wanted in a card really this is pretty much as good as it gets folks so spirit of the night very important for us 
And you can see the importance of, uh, of dark, right? We need to make sure we have dark very regularly and we know when we're going to be playing this card. So Dancing Shadows is move three, attack one. And the bottom is all attacks targeting you gain a disadvantage this round, uh, create dark. This is probably the worst card, <laughs> to be honest, that we have here. Really, the only reason that this card is here is for the bottom, which is to create dark. We just need some reliable ways that we can create dark. This card does not require us to have any kind of condition. Like we don't need to attack anything to make dark. We don't need to loot anything to make dark. We don't, we don't need to do it. We're just going to make dark, right? So this is just very good. And if you went early and you were feeling generous, you could potentially actually use the disadvantage to your uh, to your favor maybe and, and get an ally sort of out of trouble. But we don't really think like that if we're playing the Night Shroud. We're playing pretty selfishly normally. So really we're thinking about the dark, but you can always kind of uh, convince your friends that that's the reason why that you're helping out, <laughs> if you like. Uh, the top move three attack one is something we're not really ever going to play, but potentially you could, you know, move to a position to loot or um, finish an enemy off maybe if you like, but no, we're, we're really using it only for the bottom. Nine initiative as well is very good. Asylum Force. Uh, so this is the card that we will hopefully be using in combination with um, the bottom of Cloak of Shade on sort of the previous turn and potentially Empowering Void uh, on the turn that we're going to play Silent Force. So Silent Force is attack three, add plus two attack and gain one XP if you are invisible. It's important to remember what invisibility does and how it works. So invisibility is that you are invisible until the end of your next turn. So it includes the turn that you play it and until the end of your next turn, which is what we talk about with being able to abuse initiative a little bit, because if you go early, go invisible, and then on your next turn, you go late, you're kind of invisible for two full rounds of play, if you can time it correctly. So that can be very, very good and incredibly strong. So in an ideal world, what you would probably do is, is actually try and do that with this, is you're probably going to go early with Cloak of Shade to make yourself invisible, move three, move yourself into a nice position, go invisible and then maybe play the top of doomed breeze to be able to make and generate that dark element for you then you can go and do empowering void the next turn move to and double the value of your attack and it will actually double the attack three not the additional plus two but the attack three so this will turn into an attack eight essentially it's important that empowering void doesn't just read double damage that isn't exactly how it reads um, you know, find that out the hard way. I was playing digital and I thought it was a bug. And I was like, hang on, I swear this isn't how it's supposed to work. But actually, no, 100% from the FAQ, that is correct. That is exactly how it's supposed to be uh, done. And that is why that this is worded in that way. So keep that in mind. So that basically just doubles the three to six. And then we get the additional plus two because we would be invisible. And then our invisibility would end at the end of that turn after we've played Silent Force. And we've been on 91 initiative, maybe. So. Brilliant. We're ready to go on another turn. So Silent Force top, very good and good for attacking elites or bosses at the uh, low levels. Um, the bottom is move six, loot one. It's, again, a lot of good movement here. So we can just use this for a good move and we can use the loot one to just get a chest, get some extra coins. Um, gold is kind of important for this character. So compared to some of the other characters, this one does actually uh, need quite a bit which is counterintuitive sometimes to how the character plays we don't play a lot of loot cards we do have one that's kind of coming up that we'll talk about a bit later but we don't have access to as much looting so compared to the scoundrel who's very good at looting we don't really have that in our back pocket but we are a greedy character and we do like to try and get gold because we have a lot of important enhancements that smooth out our uh, flow of our play. And we also have some important items that you're going to want to pick up too. So trying to get gold is kind of important with this character. So keep that in mind. And we'll talk about items and enhancements and things a bit later as we go. Uh, in fact, we'll talk about one of them slightly briefly now in, in Smokestep. Because I think it's important to maybe give you guys a bit of an eye on what we're going to be trying to do with this. Um, so smoke step the top is move one attack two and we can consume dark to add an additional plus two move and additional plus two attack now this is 
fine in certain situations you may want to do this you may have no choice you may be in a situation where you just kind of have to do something like this uh, but it's really not where we're at really where we're at is we're at the bottom here you might occasionally use smoke step in that way once every few scenarios but really smoke step on where we're really looking to use it is the bottom here and it doesn't look impressive <laughs> it really doesn't but it's move one generate dark and that is just everything that's music to our ears although move one is obviously a bit underwhelming but the important thing with smoke step is we have those two enhancement dots there that are just next to that move one so we can always enhance this uh, to give ourselves additional movement which we will definitely be trying to do they're cheap enhancements and they'll make your life 10 times easier so smoke step is definitely one that is a early game target for enhancements and yeah the bottom of this just really really helps us out because it means that we can generate our element we could maybe you know do something like an attack with dark cloud which we'll talk about and then on the next turn we can then go great let's um let's kill something with spirit of the night and let's make our element again with like dancing shadows for example then you've got that element and then you can start going invisible with cloak of shade this is a very combo heavy character in which you don't want to necessarily um or at least the low levels, you need to be more focused in on your combo on, okay, on turn one, I'm going to do this. Turn two, I'm going to do this. Turn three, I'm going to do this. In fact, what I'll do is I'll actually put up on screen now, like I did for the triangles guide, because I think it's quite important. I'll put up on screen now, just a, a kind of example of the combo, the, what a combo might look like, for example, from level one with your level one cards and how you can see the flow of your turn. Now, you do have some kind of, you know, you can change these up a little bit. You can scoot a few cards around as long as you're creating dark and, you know, using it and making it again and using it and making it again. That's kind of what you need to be sort of have in your mind that you pretty much need to be consuming and generating, consuming and generating until you get to your invisibility kind of cards towards the end. And then you don't necessarily need to have access to as much dark at that point in time. But that is quite a uh, an important thing to get in your mind. So take a look at the combo. And uh, yeah, this will probably help you out a lot at level one and trying to understand. And this will also be the basis for which you'll build off of. So I won't talk too much more about the combo as we continue but this should definitely um sort of form the framework if you like for the character in your mind and get used to playing like this at level one and then you can always kind of build upon this later on okay next up we have wings of night uh this is attack one uh, invisible self uh, on the bottom is during your next four attack actions before move two as the first part of the action i actually quite like wings of the night top i've been using it a fair bit i think it's very good if you are a scaredy cat <laughs> like me um because having f basically free invisibility on a card can be very very powerful just being able to say do you know what i want to be invisible now and no one really can sort of do anything about it and especially if you're in kind of a party where you might want to play aggressively and be on the forefront a lot more and use your invisibility a bit more aggressively to um, interact with the flow of enemies and, you know, their focus and the way they move around the scenario. Then I actually think the Wings of Night is absolutely fine and you may actually consider bringing it in over something like Dark Cloud. Um, but I've left it out for this particular guys because I think that it's... Uh, the fact that the, the top is basically the only thing that it's good for for us um, and I think that Dark Cloud has at least a useful bottom that we could use to generate dark if we kind of mess up. So, but I do actually quite like Wings of the Night. I think it's uh, an absolutely fine card. And if you are in a scenario where you feel like you're getting beaten up a fair bit because you're not able to go invisible, you can actually just do something like Smoke Step Wings of the Night as your first turn, uh, go invisible, and then you're kind of safe. And then you can always do your Spirit of the Night late if you wanted to, um, which I which I think is absolutely fine. So that swings of the night top. The bottom is just during your next four attack actions before move two is the first part of the action. Um, this can help solve some of your movement issues uh, because it does just give you sort of a free move two, which is nice. Also means that you don't have to necessarily worry about playing these bottom cards that don't move, but do generate, right? You kind of still get, you kind of mash the two together and you get what you want. Um, so it, it kind of works, but it's a burn, right? And that's that's the issue here, is it's a burn. So it just just kind of misses out. But I do quite like Wings of the Night, and I don't think that the uh, the bottom is particularly bad, and I and I think the top is actually quite good, um, depending on your playstyle. So 
the next card is Concealed Dominance, which is just a whole lot of burn. So we've got Attack for Consume Knight to do a huge AoE and get 2 XP. That's an incredible amount of damage output at level 1. If you can actually get you know, 4 or 5 targets from this, that's insane value. It's really, really good value. So... I mean, for a burn effect, it's definitely up there. If you could do this and you could get some good draws off of it, and then this, yeah, it's, it's a very powerful effect. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the bottom is move four, and you can consume dark to actually move to any unoccupied hex. You cannot move through a closed door, which is interesting because if you are lagging behind and you're in a particular scenario that is perhaps a race to the end type scenario, get from A to B and don't die, this could be quite good because you can kind of go slow and just go invisible and your teammates can race on ahead because you'll have teammates who will be much faster than you. And then you can just sort of move yourself to the end hexes when you when you need to. So it's actually a viable um, sort of alternative card or sideboard card um, that you could bring into a particular scenario if you felt like, oh, this I'm struggling with movement this scenario. Maybe we can try this. But I think overall, because it's two burns, a burn top and a burn bottom, I'm really never a fan of cards that are double burns, just because they're going to be have to be used as an attack to or a move to during our turn. And this character only has nine cards, and all of our cards really do need to work for us every single rest cycle. And unfortunately, these, this just doesn't. Really like the splashy effects. I just wish that maybe the bottom of this was not a burn and much nerfed i think would be absolutely fine and then we would be all over it but unfortunately not so that brings us to our last card that we're including which is dark cloud which is attack three and curse on the top just a nice solid attack attack three curse is a nice little bit of upside too and the bottom is muddle target all adjacent enemies and create dark which is exactly what we want so dark cloud is not anything special it's not crazy good it's just a role player for us. Okay, so I'll put up now on the screen all of the cards in the board game format. So if you are wanting to pause the video here and take a look at all of the cards just in one place, nicely and easily in the board game format, then here you go. Okay, so let's go on to level two. Okay, so at level two, we have prepare for the kill. And this is the card that uh, I alluded to earlier that we should be very excited about. So it's an attack to dark on the top, which is fine. Nothing amazing. We're playing Cloak of Shade, right? Which does a very much similar thing. This is a strictly twice as good. <laughs> and the bottom, though, is really what we're excited about, which is move to make dark. We definitely want more bottom dark generators. This character just lives in the darkness and we really need to embrace it. That's like music to our ears, really, and really helps our character um, kind of get moving and get going. It's a, it's a kind of key key piece for, for what we're trying to do. So prepare for the kill. Excellent. So opposite it, though, we do have Soulfire. And this is an important card to talk about because I think this card's actually pretty decent. So we've got um, attack one, range three, and wound. And we can add stun and gain one XP if we are invisible. This is a really quite a nice little control card. And this is a kind of effect that perhaps if you're playing at two player you might actually enjoy having access to this effect now whether or not you you take it over prepare for the kill i think is yeah it's a bit of a reach because prepare for the kill is so good but i think that there's potential for you to come back for soul fire maybe at higher levels especially if you're playing two player because the top of this card is just really really solid uh if you especially if you want to go more down the invisibility route being able to wound and stun an enemy uh, stops your ally from taking damage i mean you're probably going to be invisible or you're going to maybe maybe you'll be coming out of invisibility that's always a possibility of course but yeah it, it's more so to help your team so i see this as more of a way of helping your team or potentially dealing with um very difficult high shield um like elite enemies at low levels you can kill normal enemies that's no problem for you so shields can just be ignored but at low levels shields on elites can be a bit difficult so things like an elite imp for example elite living spirit could actually cause you a bit of trouble so you do have some big attacks but it, but it, this can kind of help you yeah i actually really like the top so far i think it's very good and it can help your team out and definitely if you want to be more of an active player and involved for whatever reason <laughs> then i think that this can be a tool for that and the bottom is an attack six curse a big attack and it's a burn the top is very usable regardless i mean even if you're not invisible just being able to do an attack one and wound something isn't 
terrible. So I, I don't mind that. To actually have like a big splashy burn attack on the bottom is okay. Plus you can attack twice in a turn with this, right? If you move into position. The only annoying thing is that because it's on the bottom, we can't unfortunately combo it with Empowering Void, which you know, would be lovely to be able to attack for 12. But no not not unfortunately not available but it does uh it does mean that we could potentially you know use the attack six or we could for example do an attack two and something like that on on the top of empowering void or we can just you know use another decent attack maybe something like silent force if we wanted to if we really really wanted to kill something quickly so we're going to go prepare for the kill absolutely and i think everybody probably should however soulfire is definitely a card to think about uh for later on levels so the first card we're going to get rid of and the worst card we have really is dancing shadows for us it really doesn't do much at all the top does nothing for us the bottom does something but it doesn't move it's probably the worst of everything because it doesn't progress us um i think it's slightly worse than enervating wound just because the move four is kind of useful um because we can't move around too much so i think we're valuing just having a move four in our back pocket over just some dark generation here um, so yeah, we're going to get rid of Dancing Shadows uh, first for this one. So Dancing Shadows out and prepare for the kill in. Okay, on to level three. Okay, so at level three, we've got Terror Blade and we've got Armor of the Night. So Terror Blade, I think, um, is a very solid card. We've got Attack 3, Push 3. That is a crazy amount of push. That's a huge amount of push. Um, that will comfortably be able to go through a one or two traps potentially if they're available to you um, i also think that this card has and this particular effect has a lot more value in Guildmaster mode currently than um, potentially some other effects push is very very good in Guildmaster mode for a few reasons first being traps seem to be everywhere <laughs> hazardous terrain seems to be there if traps aren't uh, and also the amount of retaliate that you face is often quite high so being able to push things away so you don't take retaliate damage can be very very useful so uh, i i think the top of terror blade is actually very very strong and in guild master mode i think it is fantastic in the campaign i think it's good so take that as you will uh the bottom is move four all attacks targeting you gain disadvantage this round which is a nice amount of movement move four however doesn't generate any of our elements so this card doesn't generate dark and it doesn't go invisible. So those are sort of like the two kind of like prerequisites, right? That we're we're kind of looking for. We're looking for, you know, things that kill stuff, things that do a lot of damage, you know, and really dark generators is really what we're looking for at this time. We're trying to make sure that we can reliably do Spirit of the Night or we can go invisible and make our lives easier. This card doesn't do either of those two things, although in Guildmaster it can do a load of damage with that push three. So... I think this is a very, very solid card and an absolutely amazing card if we weren't so reliant on uh, on that dark and, and uh, on spending it to do good things or invisibility and things like that. Um, so the other card we got opposite is Armor of the Night, which is an attack four, and we can consume dark to do a heal for self, which is quite nice. Uh, that allows us to, you know, if we make a mistake, we get caught out by invisibility, we have a heal. Which we like to see uh, the bottom is shield one self and make dark so i quite like uh the bottom of this card because it generates us dark without us needing to really do anything you can always shield up so you don't have to interact with an enemy or anything like that to in order to get this so it's a guaranteed uh, dark generator for you you don't need to have done an attack or anything like that because if you don't perform part of the action you don't get the element right so so this is the way that you can guarantee that you can get yourself that dark and i like the top because you know if you're like me and you're not very good and you quite often forget to go invisible use your cape or you fall out of sequence you're going to probably want to heal at some point during a scenario so it's nice to be able to chuck in a free heal every now and again so the these two cards are extremely close in my opinion in terms of which one you would take and i think it's probably going to come down to personal preference if you are aggressive and you're playing Guildmaster, then I absolutely um, can see Terrorblade being a really good pickup here. 
Um, if, however, you're like me and you're not very good, then you'd probably pick Armor of the Night for that heal and also to help you maybe generate dark with the bottom when you maybe forget otherwise or you kind of mess up your sequencing in some way. So this one's kind of like a more of a safer option, if you like. Also, you could go back and take Soulfire if you really wanted to, if you were playing uh, that more kind of like involved role with your team, if you like. But uh, we're going to take Armor of the Night here. So the card we're going to swap out is very, very simple and easy. It's going to be Enervating Wound. The reason why is that basically it does everything that it does, except for the wound, um, but it's not a burn on the top. So it's basically an attack four and the heal four. We just don't get that uh, that two XP, I suppose. We do get one XP though, so that's nice. Um, so that's why we're going to be doing that. The move four on the bottom obviously is going to be missed. But as I said before, that was more of like a necessary evil. Hopefully now you're starting to get a bit of money and we can start to look at some enhancements. Perhaps you managed to get yourself Boots of Striding, or I really hope you do have Boots of Striding by this point, which gives you that additional plus two movement. Uh, so you can start enhancing Smoke Step to be a plus one move. You can start thinking about enhancing Prepare for the Kill to be a three move. And your movement will start to smooth out slowly over time. Okay, so you don't hopefully at this point in time you don't have to worry about it. now if you have blitzed through and you have absolutely no gold and no enhancements here you may struggle a bit more with your movement still um if that is the case then absolutely i could see you actually dropping something like dark cloud instead however i i honestly feel like th this is the worst card that we have currently in our sort of um, hand so we'll be getting rid of this All right on to level four so at level four, we have Nightfall and Grim Sustenance. So Nightfall is at the end of our next three turns when Dark is not strong, infuse Dark. Now, I have a, a problem with these kinds of effects. I've never liked these effects and I've pretty much never recommended any character ever take any of these effects. Um, and the reason is, is that you should be playing uh, to have Dark strong when you need Dark. I don't like relying on a card like this and to burn this to then be you know okay now i can definitely do my spirit of the night then i can do this you can do that it can be an absolute fine way to for you to finish a scenario perhaps you're planning on playing nightfall and then you're going to be using stamina potions or perhaps people are helping you get cards back and you're going to have this kind of crazy few back-to-back -back turns when you're going to maybe reuse the same cards over and over and you're going to do stuff like that so there is some use in that respect in my opinion they encourage you to not play the character in the quote unquote correct way i never like saying that there's a correct way to play any character but in the sense that you being able to ensure that you have the resources at your disposal that you need when you want them and i really dislike cards like this and it's a burn card so it kind of screws everything up for us not a fan of the top effect i'm afraid the bottom is move three attack two and then consume light to get an additional plus one attack and make dark now this is an interesting one the bottom of this actually kind of should interest you specifically if you are playing with a spell weaver in your party or perhaps some other unlockable class that has very ready access to this and this is when we get into this idea of you know like a, of a supporting build that you may want to um to have if you're playing solo so if you're playing solo and you want the night shroud to be you know the centerpiece of your party and you are concentrating on making the night shroud as good as the night shroud can be now this is a way that you can make the night shroud better with the party around them so if you're playing solo and you have that, or if you've got a very selfless um, player who's playing multiplayer with you, who's willing to allow you to steal their elements. Um, some of them don't always use light, to be fair. There are a lot of characters that do generate light and they don't always use it. So there is some spare sometimes, but it does require planning. And But if you can plan it and do it well, this is obviously excellent because you're going to get a move three with a move with an attack three kind of stuck on the end of it and night generation which is obviously incredibly good much much better than you know prepare for the kill much much better than smoke step right so there's huge upside with the bomb of this card however i think in most instances it's really not going to apply but if your party suits and that's a way you want to play absolutely i think this is a, a really good way um of doing that and it could be it could, 
I could have huge, huge benefits for you. So, yeah, uh, a caveat on Nightfall for the bottom, definitely, for sure. Uh, Grim Sustenance is attack two, add plus two attack, and gain one experience point if we are invisible, and then we get to go invisible. So this is really, really nice, because what this does is it chains our invisibility over multiple turns and basically extends our invisibility for one more turn. Um, so if we time this in the right in the right sort of way, so we go Cloak of Shade to move and go invisible, uh, then we could maybe, you know, we use Cloak of Shade and something else. Like, so we could just use like Doom Threes. Remember that we're invisible until the end of our next turn. So then on the next turn, we play Grim Sustenance and maybe something like, you know, Smoke Step or whatever you want to do to be able to get the additional plus two, do an attack of four, go invisible again. And then you finally follow up with your Silent Force, which is three plus the two attack because you're invisible and you're empowering void to do your big attack of eight so this has a really nice way of extending your invisibility over a, a long period of time and can really add up the amount of damage you can do to enemies so i really really like the top of grim sustenance also to be honest sometimes you're just going to use it as an attack to invisible self remember when i said that wings of the night actually is kind of useful if you're a bit of a scaredy cat well grim sustenance is basically wings of the night on the top right so he said this is a little bit better. It's an attack two rather than attack one. So I, I absolutely think Grim Sustenance is great. The bottom is loot one and generate dark, which is absolutely fine. We do want loot on this character. Like I said before, this is quite a, a greedy character. You're going to want items. You're going to want money for enhancements for sure. So definitely looting is something you need to um, be active in doing. Uh, there are ways for you to be able to move and loot in the same turn. Like, so this is an example of when you might actually use the top of a smoke step for something, is to move into a position to then uh, to, to loot. So you have some options to move and loot in the same turn in a, in a decent way. So that's uh, that is an option for you. Bearing in mind, though, that you can't just use this to make dark on the bomb unless you can loot. You must perform the loot action in order to generate dark. So that can sometimes catch people out. But I I love Grim Sustenance. I think it's really fun. I think it's also a really good way to us to maintain our invisibility and keep ourselves in the shadows and safe. So we'll be taking Grim Sustenance. So the card we're going to be um, taking out is we're going to be taking out Dark Cloud. Um, the reason why we're taking out Dark Cloud here is just that, to be honest, we can use the um, top of Grim Sustenance for just an attack to an invisible if we need to, um, just to kind of keep ourselves safe uh, and follow up, you know, with a quick silent force if we really, really want to. Um, the bottom generates as well. Um, muddle target all adjacent enemies. You know, this also generates with the loot one so the difference between 74 and 29 yeah there is a, a big difference there but like i said our initiative so kind of good on this character that you not you're never really making many initiative based uh choices with this character in your level up decisions so yeah it's really just a it's a slightly better card really than than other ones that we have i actually really like keeping doomed breeze because i think that the um the dark generation on the top that we get is actually really really useful um, compared to um, some of the others we do definitely want to keep a dark generator on the top because sometimes we're going to be like consuming dark for example with cloak of shade right so as long as you've got cards that are consuming dark on the bottom i think it's good to have some kind of generator on the top somewhere that you're gonna be able to throw in you know easily and doomed breeze is a very easy one to sort of throw into the mix so that's the reason why we're going to be swapping out dark cloud okay on to level five so level five, we have Claws of the Night and Black Arrow. So Claws of the Night is an attack to poison. Consume any element to get an additional plus one attack, generate dark and get one XP. So this could be an attack three, poison two targets, potentially a nice little AOE there. It's not a bad attack by any means. It's not uh, incredible. Like the Brute, for example, has Leaping Cleave, which is similar to this, but it's an attack three at level one. So in terms of the power level of what this... Um, can do it's probably on the lower end for this kind of level if you were to compare it to other characters it's not always fair to compare you know you're cap you're comparing apples and pears there so as we would say here in the uk so it's not a like for like you know every character is different and they're stronger uh, in different ways and you uh, you can't really compare one card to another very fairly but i think that you know it's a decent effect poison's a great effect we you know, poison's great, blocks enemies from healing, helps add some extra damage from your allies or perhaps yourself if you were going to, if you had actually picked up a card that attacks on the bottom, like if you were playing something like Black Knives, right? You can get the benefit from it straight away. So yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's solid. I think it's fine. Maybe a little bit uh, underwhelming for a level five card, but, but, 
but yeah, absolutely serviceable and pretty good. The bomb is during your next four move actions, while invisible, perform an attack two, target all adjacent enemies as the final part of the action. Now that is really nice, um, especially as it could actually combo with something like Empowering Void. So that gives you some some good kind of uh, some good uh, potential, you know, dream scenarios that you could you could play with this, right? Um, you can definitely um, do some good stuff. Attack to all adjacent enemies as well is great. One thing that this character, we haven't actually touched on this at this point in time. One thing that this character struggles with is a very average to sort of poor attack uh, modifier deck. So the perks that this character gets are not great. But to be honest, a lot of the time we don't really care because we're killing things. So we're not, uh, you know, we're not crying about it. Let's put it that way. However, it does mean that when you are going down more of an attack focus build and you're going to be drawing more cards, we can't expect this attack two to suddenly turn into an attack four because we draw a plus two or, you know, we're drawing all of these rolling modifiers or we're drawing all of these other things that, that help us sort of buff this attack two. You know, there's certain characters where just doing an attack one and allowing you to draw from their deck can be hugely powerful because they have such a good deck. Uh, and you could draw a huge number and it could be very impressive. The Tinkerer, for example, has some crazy, you know, they're going to add plus fours in, I think, right? So it, there are certain characters that, that these kinds of things could do wonders on. This is probably going to end up being an attack two. You might get a plus one, <laughs> you know, so it might be three value. And again, something with a shield one or a shield two, it's going to be significantly less impressive. So it's a bit unfortunate. Uh, it's a great effect. You could you could attack a lot of things. It's a bit unfortunate that this is the wrong kind of character to have this attack on, unfortunately. And it's similarly why the top is maybe not quite as good as well, is because our attack modifier deck kind of sucks. So yes, it's nice to attack two things, but we would rather probably just kill one thing instead of doing a bad attack against two things. The next card is a Black Arrow, and this card should get you pretty excited. This is definitely um, a very strong card, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge damage dealer for us, potentially. We've got Attack 4, Range 4, with Muddle, Curse, and 1 XP. Simple card, simple effect. Doesn't do anything crazy. The Range 4, though, is just crazy amounts of range. That means that you're pretty much always going to be able to hit something with this. It's very rare that you're ever going to be out of range. Also means that while focusing one enemy, you can, you know, maybe do some damage to somebody else at the same time. I think it's just, yeah, this is a huge attack. Uh, the model and curse is obviously great because there's a bit of synergy between those two. Perhaps then they draw their curse and they miss their attack because they're muddled. Really good. Really, really good. Black Arrow is top tier. An attack four as well. And like we said, we have a poor attack modifier deck and four is... It's kind of like that tipping point, right? We're doing four. Okay, now if we draw a plus one, it's five. That's going to get through some shield. That's going to be some guaranteed damage right there. So yeah, really like the top of Black Arrow. Uh, the bomb is invisible self. And the and we can maybe consume dark to do an attack three at range three. So I'm not hugely high on the attack three, range three on the bottom. It's nice and you will probably use it every now and again because uh, it gets you some XP and it's a free attack. However, I think the invisible though on the bottom can be very, very useful. Allows you to, you know, basically instantly set up a silent force if you really, really wanted to. Instantly set up a grim sustenance if you wanted to. Uh, it just gets you out of a hole if you're ever in trouble. Um, I really like Black Arrow. I think it's a very versatile um, card for us. The only thing it doesn't do is generate an element, which you know <laughs> would be the icing on the cake uh the cherry on top i think this is uh i think this is very strong so we're going to be taking black arrow here um definitely so now that we have access to some invisibility some sort of free invisibility i think it's it's okay for us to consider dropping cloak of shade we are losing this move three which is you know something to think about you know i do think that there is maybe an argument for getting rid of doomed breeze here because this is you know, in many ways, a strict upgrade. The thing is, is that I generally value the generators um, over the kind of consumes, if that makes sense. So just because of the way that I play, I don't always plan, you know, very rigidly exactly what I'm going to do every single um, round. If you do play um, a lot more um, regimented, if you like, and you are concentrating to the point of i know exactly what i'm doing you know three turns in a row then you may actually be able to drop doom to breeze here because you're confident in the fact you're going to have the element when you want it um, but like i said before i liked 
when we've got some things that consume elements on the bottom, I like to have ways to generate them on the top, right? So that I'm consuming on one half of the card, I'm generating on the other. And that's kind of like how I like to go through. So for me, Cloak of Shade, we would have to consume to make the invisible. Um, we can do the attack one, obviously, to make it, but I think that's probably a bit of a weak attack and a bit of a hard attack maybe for us to do. Um, you know, we'd much rather be going invisible for sure. So Black Arrow gives us that invisibility for free. We don't need to consume an element potentially. And it gives us a nice attack on the top. So I just really, really like um, Black Arrow over Cloak of Shade here. But absolutely, I could see you swapping out something different here if you were more comfortable or more confident in your, um, your rhythm of play. Okay, on to level six. So level six, we have Unseen Dread and we have Swallowed by Fear, two excellently named cards. Unseen Dread is attack three, generate dark. And the bottom is move six, jump, which is like just ridiculous. It's like, like we've been struggling with movement the entire time. We've been struggling, we've been tugging along and then suddenly we get access to a card that says move six jump, right? So I would not absolutely begrudge anybody to just slam dunk take this card and be like, yes, my movement issues have been sorted forever. And certainly if you have as much gold as I do, then I could absolutely see a, uh, a reason to just slam dunk pick this, ch chuck dark generation on the bottom of it and yeah, sail merrily off <laughs> into the sunset as an extremely powerful uh, night shroud but uh unfortunately most people probably will not have access to the gold to enhance and move six with dark so really we're probably looking at this as more of like is the attack three generate dark good and is you know can we get on without the move six jump so it's a very simple card and it could potentially unlock a lot of possibilities for us and make our life a hell of a lot easier if you have got as much gold as you as you like and if you're playing in guildmaster then i mean if you're playing in guildmaster i feel like you could probably reset this character and try this character a few different ways and i may end up doing that on my um twitch streams for um for a while just sort of experimenting a bit more with different builds because there's certainly this character has kind of like a build where what's a reasonable to expect within the campaign and then there's like a oh like you know all the bells and whistles type build which would definitely be better but it's just not within reach of the average player so uh, we're always i'm always going to focus on trying to do builds that are reasonable and within the reach of everybody rather than doing crazy ones for these types of guides who knows maybe in the future i might do some crazy ones um but yeah so unseen dread it's a very very exciting card but unfortunately it is opposite the best card in the game possibly i mean i think it might be um this card should never have been made <laughs> I, I don't think so this, this card says attack two we just ignore that uh, and it says kill one normal or elite enemy instead consume dark and any other element this is just ridiculous it's just absolutely ridiculous at this point in time once you get access to this card at level six you now have two execute cards so you can kill a normal enemy and you can kill an elite in one rest cycle and heck if you have stamina potions you can maybe start doing it again and maybe even kill a third or even a fourth if you had a major stamina potion to get back two cards if you're playing um digital it, you know you just at this point in time this is when we start moving into like the silly realms right and this is where um when we talk about this character being the most powerful character on their own this is why because being able to kill two things a turn although there are other characters that could clear entire rooms in a turn they would need support from others they would need you know positioning and things like that this is not hard to set up and do this is incredibly easy to do all you need to have is you know if you wanted to only do it once per scenario you just have a minor mana potion in your back pocket to get the other element but realistically, you're probably going to want an item that helps you generate another element and that you can get back um, through long resting. Wands, for example, uh, we'll go into items towards the end, but wands are just incredibly powerful because you don't have any hand slot items that you really need on this character. So your hands are free to carry any kind of uh, item that can generate an element for you. It's just crazy. It's definitely the best level six in the game. It's just so good. It's just so, so good. And yeah. You just, at this point in time, you're starting to get into silly, silly realms. So Swallowed by Pharaoh is absolutely the pick here. We're going to be slam dunking this. Unseen Dread is very exciting, but unfortunately not for us. Not for, not for right now, at least. 
Um, and the bottom is move three, push two, target all adjacent enemies. Don't worry about that. You'll never, ever use it for that. Okay, so the card we're actually going to get rid of now is we're actually going to get rid of Armor of the Night, which we took at level three. So it would be tempting to go back and maybe get rid of, you know, one of our level one cards, Empowering Void or Doomed Breeze. I really like Empowering Void. I have a lot of fun with it. I think it's always great to try and set it up to do a big attack. And I think as long as you have, you know, Silent Force still in your hand, I always really like uh, doing that. I think it's always a good attack. Uh, and again, I really like Doomed Breeze because I like the, the flexibility of having a top generator that's actually easy to land. And you don't have that weird kind of like, oh, do I play this for the top or do I play it for the bottom? You just generally always try and play Doomed Breeze for the top uh, after a certain point. So I, I really, I really like both of these cards. And Armor of the Night is just an attack for, and then really, if are we going to need to heal if everything's dead? <laughs> That's the question you've got to ask yourself. Do we really need to heal if everything's dead? Um, I don't think we really do. So the heal definitely won't be as useful. Also, if you're going invisible a lot, using Grim Sustenance and using the bottom of Black Arrow, using maybe an invisibility cape, are you going to be taking much damage? This character can definitely avoid getting hit very easily if you play smartly. So... Yeah, I feel that the, the heal loses value over time, and this basically just turns into an attack four. Um, so it's just not quite as good. I mean, obviously, we can turn it into an attack eight easily with Empowering Void, but I just don't think that that's really what we're what we're trying to do. We don't want to be too greedy, um, so we should take out something that consumes an element for something else that is going to want it. So we're going to uh, take out Armor of the Night here, and we're going to be bringing in uh, the OP, Swallowed by Fear. So at level seven, uh, we've only got one card in digital at the moment. We'll put the other card up on screen in a second to talk about that. But uh, Quiet Frenzy is attack three, add plus two attack and gain one experience point if we are invisible. And then we can consume dark to get an additional plus three attack. So this could be an attack eight all within one card without us needing to use Empowering Void. So that should definitely start to, um, to excite you a little bit. And the bomb is just attack three, move three. It's probably, you're probably not really going to be using it for the bottom, but you might do. There, there, there is possibly. The thing is, is that the bottom of all of our cards have always been reserved for move, make dark. So if a card doesn't say move, make dark on the bottom, then you should probably be justifying the reason for taking it for just the top rather than the bottom as well. So, uh, so yeah, so Quiet Frenzy, we absolutely love. Um, so we will probably be picking this, but it wouldn't be fair to at least not talk about the other cards uh, that is there. Um, so the other card is Eyes of the Night, which I will put up on the screen now. So Eyes of the Night is we gain advantage on all of our attacks and we can target invisible enemies. Uh, 2 XP and it's a persistent ability so we just get it for the rest of the scenario it just goes up in our active area and it stays there for the rest of the scenario permanent strengthen <laughs> if you like permanent advantage now that is very 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 strong potentially on certain characters and unfortunately as we've discussed about this character before our attack modifier deck is just not particularly great yes it can stop you from missing so that is a valid, um, that is a valid um, kind of thing. However, really, we don't benefit from advantage. So if we don't really benefit from advantage, do we really benefit from targeting invisible enemies? Well, no, not really either. Because there's only a few enemies in the game completely who can go invisible. You know, we'd have to be against night demons or wind demons. It's just not really... Um, it's just far too niche. It's far, far too niche. I love the theme of this card. I think the theme is great. It really, um, like it really fits the character very, very well. I think it really, really does. But it just doesn't do anything, right? It just does not really do anything most of the time. And that is a problem. So the top is not great. So I think we can kind of disregard the top. The bottom is move five, um, consume light to model target all adjacent enemies and then we can generate dark on one xp so this is kind of similar to uh nightfall right because in nightfall if we have that light generation nightfall turns into an incredibly powerful card similarly bottom of eyes of the night turns into an incredibly powerful card if you can reliably consume that light to be able to move five and then generate because it just becomes a much much better version 
of uh, prepare for the kill or smoke step, right? That's what it does. Um, but uh, we can't account for that in this guide because I have no idea what you guys are going for. But do keep that in mind. And if you are playing like a solo playthrough and you want to play duos and you're thinking, hmm, what character could I pair with the Night Shroud? pair a light generating character with them i would suggest and i would suggest you know then you can maybe have some fun trying out nightfall um and um eyes of the night and you know probably having some great success with them but for us we're only taking quiet frenzy which is handy because it's the only card we currently have in digital so the card we're going to be getting rid of for quiet frenzy is we're actually going to be uh getting rid of silent force the reason is is that both of these cards are kind of terminate our um our invisibility and really quiet frenzy is just like a strict upgrade really on silent force and allows us to save empowering void potentially for playing with a different card maybe like black arrow for example so uh, i really like the fact that it's just a straight strict upgrade on uh, on silent force and yeah we just don't really look back we don't want two cards that do this kind of invisible thing without chaining the invisibility on right and grim sustenance is great because it chains the invisibility on gives us another turn of invisibility and these two unfortunately kind of end invisibility unless we were to place some other invisibility effect with them or potentially draw a invisibility uh card so uh from our modifier deck so i think we um we get rid of um silent force here and we get quiet frenzy it's a nice simple uh swap for us okay on to level eight Okay, so at level eight, we have Gloom Darts and we have Lurking Ruin. So Gloom Darts is attack three, range four, poison, curse. Hmm, pretty good. Is it as good as Black Arrow? Well, yep, yeah, poison is definitely better than a muddle. So we would take that. But the real spicy, <laughs> a little bit spicy thing about this card is the Consume Dark and Target three. So being able to... Um, to do that and being able to potentially target three things with this that's three curses that's nine damage plus your draws and it's poison to all those targets that's very very strong so gloom darts is a very very good attack card super super good really really useful and to boot the bottom of this card is just insanely good for us too it's a move three generate dark it's we're just slowly getting better we got a move one dark at uh, level one we've got to move to dark uh at level two we've had to wait until level eight to get the move three but i think it was worth it uh, so gloom darts absolutely love it uh we're, we're going to be taking gloom darts but we will talk about lurking ruin as well but gloom darts yep yeah, absolutely love this card it's great uh lurking ruin is attack five add poison muddle and wound and gain in experience points if we are invisible and this is actually really really good effect i i really really like the bottom of um, the top of lurking ruin because being able to add poison and wound uh, means that essentially we're going to be doing an additional one point of damage hopefully with the wound tick of damage so you can almost treat this as like an attack six with upside the poison is going to obviously buff our allies if you are playing some kind of build where you would have extra attacks on the bottom you can obviously make good use of that poison as well and um the muddle is just a nice way to maybe mitigate a little bit of damage potentially i think lurking ruin top is a very good attack also is very very good with empowering void allows us to attack for 10 which is sort of the most we've ever been able to so if you were trying to get max value out of empowering void this is definitely the card to do it uh, so yeah absolutely love um of the top of lurking ruin it's kind of a shame that it's opposite gloom darts but the top is is very good and i can absolutely see people wanting to pick it uh, the bottom is move three invisible self plays into the strategy of the card which is that they want to be invisible so really really like i think lurking ruin is probably the one of the best um enablers for the kind of more invisible strat so if you're going down the route of being a bit more invisible then doing some kind of ranged attacks potentially doing like soul fire shenanigans i think lurking ruin is an absolute great card for doing that um because you can kind of move three and make yourself invisible for free, you can straight away get the benefit of the invisible on a top, like Soulfire or Grim Sustenance, for example. So, yeah, I think I think Lurking Ruin is a great card. It really is. Um, but for us, Gloom Darts, the bottom enabler is super super good, and the top attack is huge, potentially huge. So, yeah, Gloom Darts, easy pick. 
Okay, so the card we're going to swap out for Gloom Darts is actually we're going to say goodbye to our trusty Empowering Void finally. So the reason why is that now we don't actually have too many attacks that we get um, great value out of doubling anymore. So now that we have um, Quiet Frenzy, we actually want to consume the dark here. It's a Quiet Frenzy... Um, now kind of encompasses everything that Empowering Void can do. You know, we're not running Silent Force anymore, so we can't, you know, make that any better. So realistically, well, we're, we're wanting to, to use Quiet Frenzy as our, like, big um, sort of single target attack now. Uh, also, Gloom Dart's top. We want to consume the dark to do the target three if we're ever going to consume the dark. You know, we're not going to. It's very unlikely that we'd want to double Gloom Darts. You might want to, but so really the only thing that Empowering Void can you know, sensibly double is is Doomed Breeze for an attack two. Not particularly great. Or potentially like Black Arrow. You know, potentially Grim Sustenance maybe. So um, yeah, it's just uh, it's starting to lose value specifically because it just doubles the attack of uh, of the ability rather than just giving us a double damage right it's not smoke bomb which is uh important to, to to talk about so we're going to lose empowering void here and we're going to bring in gloom dance okay on to level nine okay so at level nine we've got angel of death and we've got voice of the night and we're taking angel of death purely because how could you say no to a card called angel of death <laughs> playing the night show well let's talk about angel of death we are definitely taking it <laughs> and there are a few reasons why and it won't take you long to figure out why uh but angel of death is attack for target all adjacent enemies or we could consume to kill all normal enemies instead yes that is what that card does and yes that is very good <laughs> the burn obviously is a is a big drawback uh, only being able to do it once, but if you manage to walk into a room and kill four enemies, I think that's worth a burn. <laughs> I think most people would say that that was uh, the value was achieved there. So, yeah, the top of Angel of Death is, is a huge, huge attack. Can just completely change a scenario, really, because you know scenarios are usually quite finely balanced and just small things i say small things but just things like removing enemies from the board and you'll you'll know this from maybe playing you know this character up to now being able to kill enemies it just turns the tide in your favor every time and so just burning a card to kill a load of enemies and then maybe you just have to mop up a room the scenario will end quicker which means that you will rest you know less means that you will burn cards less through having to long rest and short rest to continue the scenario you will get through things quicker basically burning you know burning one card for angel of death fairly early on to kill a load of stuff may end up saving you two cards through rests later on it, it's crazy good also also the bottom of it is pretty damn good as well because that has a move five jump kill one adjacent normal enemy non-burn so now we can kill something on the bottom of a card. We can kill something with the top of a card. And it's got that jump on it too, which is something that we've been sort of missing out a little bit. We have been stunted a little bit. And sometimes certain scenarios can hurt us because of that. If there's lots of traps or um, hazardous terrain we need to walk through or difficult terrain that may, may make it a little bit difficult for us to traverse. Uh, jump, very, very useful for us. And we're, we're finally glad to have that if we didn't get Unseen Dread earlier. So... Killing one nor adjacent normal enemy, obviously incredibly strong. We can use this, then we can go invisible potentially with Grim Sustenance or something like that. Uh, what I like to do though is I like to have, you know, generators. So the reason why we still have Doomed Breeze just chilling, just chilling out here, it doesn't seem very good. But with Angel of Death, we can, you know, move five, jump, kill something, Doomed Breeze, something else, create our element, then next turn kill something again move maybe with smoke step and then perhaps then we kill an elite with swallowed by fear you can see how crazy this can get you can reliably kill maybe three enemies a rest cycle and if um you know you could even accelerate it to be within the first three turns if you had an ally go um, before you and create dark for you on turn one you could actually just go kill an enemy next turn kill an enemy next turn kill an elite if you wanted to like it's it's pretty crazy. You can do it in any order you like. <laughs> so, yeah. Angel of Death, super, super strong. Very, very busted. Probably one of the best level 9 cards in the game, I think. There are only a few other characters that, that 
are probably even in the conversation the good thing about this is that it's all all on you as well like i said before this character is the best if you just look purely at the character the potential that a character like the Spellweaver has at level 9, the Spellweaver could actually be better than the Top of Angel of Death, you could argue. And there is a world where that could be possible um, with lots of buffing and you know certain situations and items and things like that, that that could happen. However, just this character playing on their own with very minimal setup, this is a hugely impactful card, very, very powerful. So, yeah, Angel of Death. The other card is Voice of the Night, which is on our next five attacks. While invisible, we can add stun to the attack. Um, I'm not much of a fan of this. The reason being is that if we are on the invisibility build, we're trying to be invisible as much as possible. Stunning only really helps our allies, uh, which if you're going down the ally route with like soul fire and trying to be a bit more helpful to your team, then sure, that's a nice thing for you to do. But you've probably been playing quite selfishly up to this point, And you've probably understand why at the beginning of the guide, I was talking about how you're having a lot of fun, but other people aren't having much fun watching you. So uh, the top of this card's kind of at odds as to what we've been trying to do up to now. And I think it's really kind of at odds with the character in general. You want to kill things. You don't want to be stunning things. So I'm not a huge fan of the top of Voice of the Night. Uh, the bottom is move to attack to, consume any element to go invisible and create dark. If you've got elements kicking around, this is very, very good. Again, it, it's it's a strict upgrade on something like smoke step or prepare for the kill, right? If you haven't enhanced them, uh, you can go invisible as well, which means that you could then play it potentially with, you know, something like Grim Sustenance. Um, yeah, it can be very, very good. It can be. And then you can immediately, you know, go into a quiet frenzy turn. So I think Voice of the Night bottom has some good use. Absolutely. It's again, the thing is, is that you can only choose one level nine card. And when you have a card like Angel of Death hanging out there, it's very, very hard for you to choose anything other than it. So we are going to be picking Angel of Death. Okay, so the card we're going to be swapping out for Angel of Death. Well, really, we can swap out pretty much anything that you want at this point in time. <laughs> You can sort of go however you feel. If you've been enjoying doing the invisibility side of things, then enjoy it. I wouldn't really uh, encourage you to play this character at level nine a lot. I think it's very, very powerful, maybe too powerful, and the novelty starts to wear off. So most people won't get to play level nine for very long. In Guildmaster and Gloomhaven Digital, you can obviously play level nine to your heart's content. And um, yeah, you can have a lot of fun with it. Personally, I'm going to be swapping out Grim Sustenance. It doesn't really make much difference to me. It's just not a very good attack. And Angel of Death is great. And like I said, I really do like Doomed uh, Breeze just because it keeps that night generation going. Now, once you start doing your perks, you may find that Doomed Breeze you don't actually need, but I think it's just a safe way. Because now what I can do is, you know, I can go Angel of Death and kill something. Then I could do Doomed Breeze to generate nice and easily. Then on the next turn, I could do like Spirit of the Night and I could do Smoke Step. Then on the next turn after that, I could do... Um, swallowed by fear and I could do prepare for the kill you know and then potentially you could go into something like a huge gloom darts so once your levels start to increase you definitely um, start to free yourself up a little bit um, and you can absolutely um, you know mess around a lot with the ordering of your cards a lot more you have a lot more freedom with the levels the the strict kind of combo nature of the character does start to disappear the higher level you get because you just get lots more kind of gold and cards at your disposal to make things easier so yeah that's what i'm going to be dropping but to be honest yeah this is all up to you you can you can choose whatever you like here okay so there we go at level nine our max level night shroud so i will put an image up now of all the final cards in the board game version okay so before this character is hugely powerful level nine perhaps the most powerful character in the game um certainly if you're just playing like a duo then the night shroud will outclass anybody it's up against uh so it is worth bearing in mind this character is quite a selfish character and it's a lot of fun to play and i do encourage everybody to give it a go because it's, it's a hell of a lot of fun to play but it is a character that uh in my opinion gets old pretty quick just because of how good it is so it, it does take some fun and challenge out of the game in my opinion so so yeah maybe a character that should never really have been made or at least been nerfed a little bit uh but yeah it's a fun character to play uh definitely
Okay, so let's go over to perks. So for your perks, as I said before, your perks for this character are not particularly great. You do draw some attack modifier cards for, you know, Silent Force and things like that early. So um, you are going to want to still take perks. So doesn't necessarily mean that you can completely ignore your battle goals, folks. I do think maybe you want to, to do it and you may as well try and do them anyway. Um, if you're playing the campaign and uh, you have access to the perk ignore negative scenario effects i absolutely recommend that as the first perk that you take ignore negative scenario effects and add two plus ones to your deck it's a very very strong perk for this character probably the best perk that they have so just grab that straight away because you don't really want to be starting a mission you know poisoned or you don't wounded or muddled or immobilized any of those kind of like nasty things that can happen to you um, because of the negative um, campaign things it just it puts you off of your stride and you really want to be able to do that because if you if you're immobilized at the start of the scenario then suddenly you can't do your smoke step as your first turn then you know the the wheels can come off pretty quickly sometimes so yeah little things like that can really upset you. then you're just going to want to work on your usual stuff so consistency to remove your minus ones for twilight and umbra I do quite like these, but I would only ever take these in pairs. So if you're playing in Gloomhaven Digital, you can hold your perk points. And if you can hold your perk points, I would wait until you had four or just two and do this, then this, then this, and this. Immediately removing the minus one. I don't think you want to be putting minus ones into your deck and leaving them there. So just bear that in mind. If you're playing in the campaign, you don't have the access to do that if you're starting at level one. Then in which case, it's a bit rougher. So you probably don't want to be doing, um, it, it's, a, it's a bit rougher for you. You probably have to take a minus one and do this. It's not ideal. But the chances are, if you're playing the campaign, you're probably not coming in at level one. You're probably coming in at a higher prosperity level, maybe with like three or four perks, hopefully, in which case you can kind of do this all in one go and just get it, get it over and done with because it is very good. But yeah, it's not one, you don't want to be having minus ones hanging out in your deck for too long. Uh, so let's just say that we we've done that so we can kind of go for it. This is also a good time where you can start to think about doing dust because we're starting to move our deck in a more positive way. We definitely want to be trying to draw our plus ones over our plus zeros with this character if possible. So don't mind doing this. So we're doing dust. Then probably your order is going to be something like adding the invisibles. Do keep in mind that there are maybe some corner case scenarios when doing this is actually bad because if, for example, you're playing two player and you are trying to do a little bit of tanking for your team and then you draw your invisible attack modifier yeah that can be frustrating for your uh <laughs> for your friends so bear that in mind that although being invisible is usually exactly what you want sometimes actually you might want to take a hit for your friend and this will cause you not to do that then you've got uh maybe confuse i don't really like confuse at all uh, you got recover to add heal i don't really care for healing as we said before you probably don't really need that much healing. Cursing is probably better here uh, for you. So I would probably go down and get in cursing. Then you can consider maybe going and taking the uh, the models or the heals. But so you're killing things. So you will occasionally be attacking stuff from invis. So perhaps the heal ones are good. Because this is a rolling plus one as well. So this is actually some damage. So perhaps this would be, um, this would be better. Okay. So let's take a look at some items. Okay. So for items for this character... It kind of goes without saying that you're going to want boots of striding straight away. If you have access to better ones, boots of sprinting, boots of dashing, absolutely that's what you want. I do think that you can probably just get by with just standard boots of striding. Also, if you're trying to save gold, which you might want to do, then bear that in mind because there are enhancements. And definitely enhancing plus one move is going to be better than you spending the extra money on a pair of boots. So in the long run... That's probably going to be a better investment for you because uh, you can always stamina potion to get that card back and do it again. But you can't stamina potion to get boots back and you don't want to use your small item slots to fill <laughs> to put items in that could do that, if that makes sense. So I think boots of striding is yeah just your go to and you can obviously get better boots if you have the money to or if you are, you're inclined to. So we'll just rock some some boots of striding, steal them from my mind thief there. So um in terms of other items, a level one, Cloak of Invisibility, obviously makes a lot of sense, allows you to go invisible and immediately gain the benefits of it whenever you like. I think it's really, really good for that. Now, small items, stamina potions, stamina potions, stamina potions. Goes without saying, being able to repeat a execute effect is going to be incredibly strong. Mana potions are also very good. You might need a major eventually if you plan to generate dark 
and the element you need to kill the elite with Swallowed by Fear. But usually a minor mana potion is going to do it for you because by the time you've stopped using that to generate dark, perhaps, because you might in the early level still need it to generate dark for you, by the time you've stopped doing that, you can then just start using it for the other element that you need to do Swallowed by Fear. So a minor mana potion is probably going to be absolutely fine. But I think early game, you're going to be wanting to getting stamina potions, really. Those are your kind of ideal uh, potions you want to go for. Now, in terms of head items, things that, again, allow you to abuse those stamina potions. So Empowering Talisman, very good. It allows you to get back a stamina potion to then do it again, or perhaps get back a mana potion to then be able to do a big kill again. Another amazing, amazing item for you is actually Pendant and Dark Packs. It's incredibly expensive, but this is a pretty much broken item with this character, it has to be said. Being able to refresh two of our consumed items, so maybe getting back two stamina potions or getting back a stamina potion and a mana potion to be able to just do everything over again. The curses just, we do not care about gaining those curses because we're just killing things. Incredibly strong item for us, very thematic as well, Pendant of Dark Packs. Uh, the other items that you might consider, I won't talk too much about the solo item, um, scenario item, but it's incredibly, incredibly good. So if you can get access to that, then I suggest you do. Uh, hand items. So for hand items, I absolutely love wands for this character. Um, I've tried running the Nightblade, and at first this felt like it was a great idea. Just being able to, because I was generating so much dark, sometimes when I didn't actually need it. And especially when you start drawing, you, you're putting those dark cards into your um, modifier deck, right? And you start actually drawing dark through that means as well. Um, but to be honest, you're just wanting to consume dark to use your cards. So you just never really find a good use for this. Although this seems like it would be a good idea. Actually, I found it to be kind of counterintuitive to what we're doing. So I would really um, in, in, encourage you to get a wand. It doesn't really matter what wand it is. Completely up to you. There's one for each of the different elements. So take it as you like. Obviously, if you wanted to go down the route of using light and using some of the cards that generate light, then getting the wand that generates light would be ideal. That would be the ideal situation but yeah and to if you could get for example two different ones because these are only single-handed items then you can stamina potion get back swallowed by fear it means you can short rest and you know you don't have to worry about these not refreshing yeah so ones ones are very very good so on to enhancements so enhancements for this character as we've talked about a little bit there are some like absolute gimme 100% go for these as soon as you can and that is plus move on smoke step and that is plus move on prepare for the kill as soon as you get the character really as soon as you get any gold if you are starting the character at a high level through prosperity and you can enhance straight away I would encourage you to do this straight away with any of the gold that you may get just just do it and thank me later it just makes your life so much easier to have plus one move on here uh, and eventually you can even make it you know an additional one it's going to cost a lot of gold you know, it really is. So worth bearing in mind. Another um, sort of, that's why really you want to sort of split your enhancements here is because the cost is going to go up with each enhancement that's on there. So this, these two moves here are obviously very, very good. Another thing that you can do if you get the gold is just stick another element on the bottom of this and then you've immediately got Swallowed by Fear. So you, you don't even need items then. So that's always an option that's open to you if you are very, very rich. Those are kind of really the only enhancements that I that I really recommend. You can continue to add extra move on there if you like. Uh, but like I said, really, that's that that's all you want. Move. Move it will make your life a lot easier. And, and maybe an element. You know, that's, that's really all you need to do with this character. Everything else is just gravy on top or you're just wasting gold you know giving additional range to gloom darts additional movement here 205 right doesn't make really that doesn't make financial sense to really upgrade a really high level card so yeah that's what that's what i would do and certainly doesn't make any sense to, to chuck anything on doomed breeze you could if you want to do you know chuck something you know if you had a lot of gold and you were feeling spicy maybe chuck a wound on there that's quite a nice thing to do maybe chuck a disarm on there if you're feeling particularly flush so, you know, there you go. There's maybe a little uh, enhancement you could do if you've got some extra gold kicking around and, uh, yeah, want to make your life even easier. So there you have it, everyone. There is my guide. This character is insanely powerful, really, really fun to play. I don't really advise people to play this character for very long. If you get it to level 9 and you just continue to play throughout 
the game just with your level nine, you're going to find it way too easy, in my opinion. So change it up for a challenge. But it is always fun to get a taste of that power every now and again. And it is a very fun character to play. So hopefully you found the information useful. And if you did, toss the video a like or consider subscribing if you'd like to see more guides coming in the future. As always, guys, I do also stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash mandatoryquest every Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday. Pretty much always Gloomhaven nowadays. So come hang out, chat Gloomhaven, maybe even play Gloomhaven because we're doing a community playthrough live on Sunday. So just come hang out, have fun, and yeah, maybe we can chat some Gloomhaven there. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. I do really, really appreciate it. I will catch you in the next one. Bye. I think so. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Scout oh, the wins. Best. That's the best thing from the chat. That's the blessing so, from. Uh, uh, Isaac, at this point, can we uh, get your approval to add an additional attack modifier deck for allies in the digital version? <laughs>